thank you both very much for joining us. Uh, maybe we start by having you each introduce yourselves. I'm Rachel Chanoff, and I'm the Director of Programming at the Center Series here at the 62 Center, Williams College, and I'm the producer of Rewind. And I'm David Eppo, and I teach here at the Theatre Department at Williams College, and I um, was involved with Re Rewind from the beginning when I heard some of the early spots from Philip Miller. Great. Well, maybe you could start by just telling us a little bit, David, how the creation came about. What was the inspiration? How did the whole thing get going? Okay, so there's the memory thing that happened. The way I remember it is that I, I flew to Johannesburg, as I often did and do, because my family is there, my friend. And uh, my friend Philip Miller picked me up at the airport, and uh, he put a CD in his car on the way back into town and said, listen to this. And he, sh he played me... I think two or three tracks of what finally became the cantata. And um, I watched him work that time in Johannesburg. I watched him create pieces and work on this amazing project. And I came back to this country and I gave these two or three tracks to um, Brad Wells, who's our choir master. Um, and I said, call me in the morning, and he did, and he said, I don't know what this is, but I want to do this. And that's how it began for me, and I, I guess you and I talked about it then. Yeah, I had been in Johannesburg, and Philip also played it for me, mm -hmm. and we realized that we definitely, it was just a piece that was so powerful, even though it was in such an early stage, that we wanted to make it happen, no matter what it took. And it really took a combination of, um, interestingly, uh, the, the drivers behind being able to, um, to support the work were Bill Wagner, mm. who is not only just um, a music lover, but dedicated to culture being, moving the ball forward in terms of social justice. So Bill made a big commitment to it. And then in New York, at the exact proper moment, Elliot Spitzer, who was the district attorney, uh, was made the uh, radio, no, the record companies were involved in a big payola scandal, and they had to give millions of dollars to cultural work. And we went in for a huge grant to the Elliot Spitzer Fund, and between Bill and Elliot Spitzer is how we funded the work. And then we started it at Mass Mocha. We had an mm -hmm. initial wor uh, workshop at Mass Mocha with Williams students. Okay. And um, that was the springboard for its creation. Okay. Uh, David, did you no, want to no, ask No, no, it just uh, uh, reminded me that we st when we started with Williams students, and I recall them rehearsing, uh, the, the Williams College Choir rehearsing these sometimes very difficult pieces of music. Um, being so incredibly moved by how these young Williams kids could go to these places that the music uh, asked them to. And it was extraordinarily moving to listen to it at that stage, right here in our rehearsal rooms in, in, uh, the, in the music center. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting because the piece itself is so representative, representative of something that's happened historically. The very first workshop that happened was at St. George's Cathedral, Desmond Tutu's Church in Cape Town. And the piece was in very early stage and very different than it was. Mm -hmm. And the ending was this joyous, happy celebration. And all the collaborators mm -hmm. looked at the work, having gotten it to that point, and said, this is the exact wrong tone of this piece. It isn't about, mm -hmm. it's about reflection and mm -hmm. uh, danger and grief and, you know, and reconciliation, but it's not about joy, mm -hmm. really. Or celebration. Or yeah. celebration. Yeah. And it's interesting because it's kind of come full circle, as you know, under, you know, thanks to you, we're bringing it back to Williams College in its installation form. And the artists all feel that it's such a different moment in South Africa that this feels old and tragically full of possibility that didn't happen. Mm. So just as it started in a joyous way and that wasn't appropriate, I think mm. the artists are feeling the conversation around this piece is about, um, is about kind of loss and unfulfilled aspirations. So it's mm. really interesting that a, uh, an artistic work can track uh, mm -hmm. this historic, this really sad historic trajectory. 
So you've mentioned Williamstown, you've mentioned New York, you've mentioned South Africa. Um, I wonder if you could just sort of give us a sense of the scope of how this production played out. I mean, those, those are players from a yeah. lot of different places. How did it come together? Where all did it end up being performed? It was uh, kind of hilarious by the seat of our pants exercise because mm -hmm. the first time as we started um, it as a residency at Mass Mocha, where Brad and the Williams students fully participated. And it's a piece that has four South African soloists and a string octet, but also a chorus of a hundred. So to decide you're going to tour, or you're going to create a piece with a chorus of a hundred is, is pretty ambitious. Um, and also the scenic elements are this gorgeous, gorgeous film that Maya and Gerhard Marx made. Mm -hmm. um, so we decided after we had found the funding sources for it that it would open at Celebrate Brooklyn. And mm -hmm. Celebrate Brooklyn, of course, is outdoors, so there's always the threat of you've put so blood, sweat, and tears, flown hundreds of people all over the globe, and it's going to rain on your parade. So it involved a lot of you know, prayer as well as everything <laughs> else. But we had not only the Williams students in the chorus, but we had a local Baptist choir in the chorus. From Brooklyn. From Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also had a core South African choir who were expats, many of them from the production of The Lion King. Mm -hmm. And our music director for that part of the chorus was also the music director from Lion King because uh, the lyrics are often in Zulu. And what was interesting is when we toured this piece, we had all different kinds of choirs, including at the South Bank in London. We had a choir of pensioners, basically, you know. From old, Kent. From Kent. Little, <laughs> like, little, little, little ladies from Kent. Gardeners Aww. who were, you know, and they all just committed to not only learning the lyrics, but. They the, learned to dance. They learned the toy toy, which is there. Yes, exactly. They, on, the, on the performance do, night, they toy toy. Oh, no, I won't. <laughs> But they, these, these pensioners yeah. got into the spirit of this remarkable music. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it isn't a celebration, but in a way, the people who, who, who were part of it, it was very hard for them. Some of the lyrics are very hard to say. In fact, there was an incident in the early stages, I don't know if you recall, Rachel, in Brooklyn, b before Celebrate Brooklyn, when we were at Bri uh, the, when, oh, Brick, Brick. When we when one of our students, our William students, was, ran off the stage and she wouldn't sing. She said, I can't sing, this is not my story. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? And, and uh, Fiki Le, who was one of our uh, soloists from, from South Africa, went after her and said, you can do this, it is your story, it is all our stories and you have to help us talk. So it was always terribly difficult and to do that. And the, the conversation around appropriation and how appropriate it is to tell who gets to tell whose story. That's right, yeah. You know, whose story is it and who has the right to tell that story. And Philip, the composer, you know, as a white Jewish South African, always felt very tentative. That was his fear, was that mm -hmm. was it allowable for him to tell these stories? Um, and when we did it in Johannesburg, he, we had a lunch before the first performance with many of the people that are, their you know, verbatim uh, yeah. conversations are represented in the piece, or if they were no longer alive, their mothers were there in this room. And they all just straight out told Philip, we're so glad you're telling these stories. And it was like a weight had been lifted because he had been authorized, really, to be the... But, but there had been criticism of him, remember, before yeah. that. And he was, as you say, worried yeah. about it. Yeah. And also when, when they did it at the Baxter Theatre in Cape Town, a, year, a couple of years couple later, of years later, the families were invited to be there yeah. and to support. And they did, uh, for the most part, yeah. or mostly, yeah. support it entirely. But it is a question, as Rachel says, of who can tell whose stories. Yeah. And I just remember Fikila saying, this is, if, you, if it's not all of our story, then it's not right. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of the story, maybe could we back up just a little bit, and David, uh, coming from South Africa, maybe you could sort of set the stage in terms of that the text is taken from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission hearings. Maybe could you talk a little bit about that and how that came to be in Philip's hands as something that he decided eventually to well, well, I will, but I want Rachel to jump in as well. So uh, the way I remember it is that there is this book which I have brought here. It's called uh, Country of My Skull. 
and it's by an Afrikaans poet by the name of Anki Kroch. And uh, she was a journalist with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission for, two, for the two and a half years that it was in operation. And, um, but she's a poet and a writer. She was a journalist for, this, um, for the radio. And she wrote this account. And I believe that she got in touch with Philip okay. right in the early stages. And she said, I want you to help me make some kind of musical tribute or musical memory of this. And that's when, when Rachel says he was really, um, he didn't know, that he, in fact, he said no, I think. He said he couldn't do that. And I think um, what happened was that he started to think about um, the Shoah, the Holocaust, and about people who have made tributes to that and how hard that must be. And um, um, he also looked, he started to really uh, look at Zulu uh, call and response mm -hmm. um, uh, um, ideas, and slowly he got to be fascinated with the actual words and, uh, of the archives. You know, the, the piece is called uh, rewind a cantata for voice, tape, and testimony. Isn't that right? Yes, yeah. Yes, yeah. And so he looked at, at he he used words from he used voices from the tape. Um, and one of the things about South Africa, it's got uh, it's got th th eleven or something official languages, and there was often a babble of. Um, noise in the commission because things had to be translated from Koza to English to Zulu to Afrikaans. So there was often this babble of noise going on, this cacophony of sound. And Philip used all of that in the making of this piece. Um, and, so, and so it began really with this, with this idea from Anki Kroch and then it became Philip's piece. I think she was not really involved in it afterwards. Yeah. And then Gerhard Marx, the, uh, the director, and he, it's the first thing he's directed because he is a really stunning visual artist, mm. and he took this on. Um, and I think the visual, uh, the visual piece of this is as compelling as the yeah. musical piece of it. And his work with, with Maya, was a lot of the visuals are places where the, either the incidents took place or places where the Truth and Reconciliation Commission took place. And it's kind of a stunning portrait that supports the, test of the language of testimony. And it, uh, uh, the cantata takes place behind this huge scrim on which this is projected. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, and you see the cantata of a hundred voices appearing or disappearing depending on, on what's happening and some of the soloists come in front and make the piece. Um, um, it's very moving. Um. Thanks. Um, I know that one of the three committees of the, the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, was referred to as the Reparation and Rehabilitation Committee and they were charged with restoring victims' dignity. Um, as well as formulating proposals for rehabilitation. And so I was curious, as this was coming into being, was there a sense that through this creative process that that would contribute to restoring the victim's dignity? Was it more about consciousness raising um, in the U.S.? I assume that I think was not all, necessarily. I think all of these things, but the piece wasn't made, I think that was happenstance. I don't think it was made specifically for the U.S. I think the, it, no. Philip knew it would resonate at home, um, but we just felt, as David just said, that, and as Fakile said, it's a story from all over. And uh, since it's a global story, we really wanted to, to bring it to a global audience. Mm -hmm. so. And what were the responses, both at Williams and in Brooklyn? It was kind of extraordinary because um, in Brooklyn, it was in a big outdoor free situation. And so the Brooklyn audience was you know, about 7,000 people. And it was people who are music lovers. So they're there to hear the music. There are people who just come to celebrate Brooklyn because that's where they get their culture on a Friday or Saturday night. Mm -hmm. And then there's what we call the accidental audience. It's people who are having a barbecue or a soccer game or a birthday party and see something over at the band shall so come over and are totally surprised. Mm -hmm. And the piece is so compelling and so about both the, the depth and the height of humanity 
I mean, it's such a visceral piece about what humans are capable of on all ends of the spectrum that it was just riveting. And there was really a moment of silence after, and it did, you know, and they didn't know what to expect, really. Um, and so after the piece was over, there was a moment of silence and then just this amazing roar from 7,000 people. So truly an extraordinary audience to see it with there. Yeah. And much different, I mean, I think impactful, really impactful everywhere, but much different at the market and it, at the Baxter in Cape Town, uh, where you had an audience that was kind of in the know and had already formed opinions and, you know, had a deep, some depth of understanding of it. And in South, at the South Bank, again, it was an audience where half of the people weren't really aware, though they'd obviously bought a ticket, so made a choice, so mm -hmm. knew kind of more about it. And here at Williams College yeah. as well, it was obviously something that was, that people knew something about and were yeah. expecting. And mm -hmm. the great thing about Williams College, as you both know, is we contextualize everything. So there had been a great deal of conversation, films surrounding yes. it, workshops mm -hmm. surrounding it. So people came kind of prepared for it to be a platform for conversation afterwards. And it was. And it was. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that this sort of brings me to the realization that of the Williams students who are here today, mm -hmm. if I do the math right, well over half of them weren't even born when apartheid ended. Right. Um, are there lessons, do you think, for the TRC process itself, for the Williams community today, with the issues that we struggle with here? I think it's an amazing and important question. Are TRCs effective? Are they meaningful, really? Are they just, after we look at the many that have been around the world for many different kinds of situations, or the same situation with a little twist in you know, Argentina and a little twist in you know, North Carolina, um, are they effective at all, or are they just kind of um, icing, not icing on the cake, or are they just a, a, a useless effort that is like a smoothing of the waters? And I think that's a really interesting conversation to be had, because it's such a beautiful concept that there can be really understanding and forgiveness, like in Rwanda, where mm -hmm. maybe it seems like it was effective, or if you scratch the surface, maybe not. I mean, it, it, that's, a, that's a conversation to be had. And I hope that conversation happens. I know that, that um, I've just been in Lebanon with a group of uh, theatre makers uh, who, uh, who had a 30-year civil war in, in Lebanon, and there was amnesty, and they're furious. This is the younger generation who say, what amnesty? For why? So that, they, so that we can still be run by the same people who were running us before, and they're still stealing from us like they did before, but now they have amnesty. So, and I think we always used to say, when we started with this, we used to say the jury is out about yeah. this. Is is there? You know, we we like to say that the truth and record that that that's why there wasn't as much bloodshed as there could have been in the transition to democracy in South Africa. And maybe that is true, but it's as true that there is dissat that that's not a satisfying exercise for people who, a lot of people who were involved and a lot of people in retrospect saying, hang on a minute, what do you mean I just needed to come in and say I did these things? That's what I did in detail, sometimes in the most horrifying graphic detail, and it's in the cantata. And then I can walk out, that, that's okay. And for many people, that's not okay. Um, but as I say, we, we say that you know, like in Argentina, you know, and Ariel Dorfman wrote a play called Death and the Maiden, in which they talk about what do we do now that it's over, that the tyranny is over. Is that okay? Is that, is that fine now? No, it's not fine. For many of the people who suffered, it's not fine and never will be fine. Never bring back that 10-year-old boy who was killed and his mother saw it on the television. We can't rewind. And that's where the title comes from. She, mm -hmm. she says, I wanted to rewind the television, but you can't rewind. And in many ways, you can't rewind. On the other hand, it's, South yeah. African now, I don't know. A, you know. But there's a, it also, it's just such a big question about forgiveness. And I think forgiveness touches us in such a personal way and such a global and political way that it's an endlessly fascinating topic. Yeah. I mean, can you forgive and not forget? Once you forgive, are you obligated to forget? Like, what, are, what goes into that very human 
act of forgiveness and what's required of it. And I think this piece just speaks to that and doesn't, maybe it's not important the success of it or the not success yeah. of it, but just the examination and deep exploration of what is forgiveness and can it really exist, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that really resonated for me and part of the reason that I thought it was important to, to try to bring this installation here was that the Gaudino sort of theme for this three years, as you know, is the question at what cost? And in this year in particular, I wanted us to grapple with the question of what is the cost of keeping memories alive, memories of collective trauma like this, and what is the cost of letting those memories go? And I wonder if you have other, other reflections Oh my goodness, on as you said, you know, most of the Williams students were born after apartheid. Even when we were not at the market with it, but at the Baxter in Cape Town, which I think was maybe in 2008, I don't remember what year we were at the Baxter, but apartheid, the younger generation was not talking about it. It was like part of their distant, distant past, and they weren't engaged in it at all. History had moved on with such a clip. You know. it, it had. I, I, must, I must also add in here that um, I, w I had a student who came to study at Williams College from South Africa, a young black kid, um, who was at the Market Theatre Laboratory, and we brought um, them here to work with our students. Anyway, when he went back to South Africa and um, was running a group for little girls, dance group for little girls in the, in, the, in the poorest of the townships, Rachel and I visited him there. And we invited him to the opening night of the Baxter, and he at the time, uh, he was certainly born during apartheid, but was probably 10 years old or something. So he effectively didn't grow up or did you know, as a young child. And he was extraordinarily moved as a young black South African by this piece. And he said, we can go forward. Um, I'm not sure that he's right because, you know, I don't know what, what's happening in South Africa does not always support that, but he was very moved and, and he was engaged. Now, as Rachel says, the born frees, we call them the born frees, who were born, who were born after, 90, after 89 or 90 when Mandela, Mandela came out of jail. Um, they're not interested in this or, or, or aware of this yeah. and in fact have demonized Mandela in many, time, many instances saying that they were sold down the river, given a bill of, of goods, and I don't know. The it's, jury's but out. it's such an interesting question. I mean, we, the but if we don't have memory, of course, exactly. then you see Donald Trump saying, "Get rid of, like, don't let any of the Muslims in," and just, I mean, honestly, you know, being Jewish, you think like, "Oh wait, that rings a bell." Yes. Like, of course. Yeah. So if you don't have collective memory and collective grief and collective, you know moral response to that, then what do you have? You, you know? have to have some reflection, yeah. otherwise. Mm -hmm. yeah. So is, it sounds like maybe there's a place for the arts then in this sort of social justice You know, I process. think that it's so important to figure out really how the arts in post-conflict society can really navigate memory, but keeping it con reflecting on contemporary issues like, what is the role of arts in post-conflict societies? I think that is such an interesting question. I, I'm, I have been traveling this year a lot, and I've seen work from all over the world, in, and I've been all over the world. I've seen work from Georgia, from Romania, from Poland. I've seen work that, that um, uh, challenges the legacy left behind by the communist and socialist countries. All of the work has been, it seemed to me, has been um, directed in this way by younger people who didn't live through it. And I think it's been very important. I've just come back from a festival in India called The Body Political, in which there is anger within the theater, within the theater um, productions, not anger, but there is, a, there is um, engagement, let me say in terms of what India is today uh, with, with the legacy of 400 years of British colonial rule. And it's very much part of the subject that people um, are using. I've seen productions in Lebanon by this company called Zukak, who we've had here as well, and I hope will come back 
um, d living in the aftermath not only of a 30 year civil war but about attacks from across the border. So I think they're, and they make work about that all the well, time. It's um, interesting because even, I mean, in, the po in popular culture, I mean, the film that won Sundance, yeah. both the Audience Award and the Jury Award this year is called Birth of a Nation. And it's by a very young, a 30 year old filmmaker who wrote it, directed it, and stars in it, and it's about slave revolt. And he, of course, is trying to capture the memory of the D.W. Griffith's birth of a nation and turn it on its head. And you think, like, this, this young artist's investment in this topic, it's just very telling to yeah. what David said yeah. about, you know, yeah. young artists. And, so. and today I've seen, in, in this year of travel that I've, seen, uh, that I've uh, had on, and I'm having, a lot of the work I've seen is directly challenging and, and facing the horrifying crisis of migrants in Europe. From across the world, from Singapore, from wherever it was, I saw plays that directly challenge that and say, we, are you looking at this? Are you? And there's one production I have where, that I have seen where the beginning scene, the actors actually drown themselves in buckets of water over and over again, trying to take, trying to take themselves out of just merely being a witness and showing that they are part and parcel of the problems that we face today, which are considerable. It's very moving to me. It's kind of what I would like to um, teach when I come back next year. Yeah. Um, maybe just in closing then, are there any sort of enduring memories of the process? Anything you've mentioned already, moments that had a real emotional yeah. impact for, for each of you. Are there other things the, you want to... Uh, one of the most enduring things was that this, at the Center Series at Williams College, the whole point of the Center Series is to really impact the students in not a transactional way. You're in the seats, there's something on the stage, but really integrate the thinking of the artists into the conversation that goes on in the Williams community. And just having the Williams choir be part of the creation of this and having Brad Wells be part of the creation and David Eppel be part of the creation, it was just exactly what the center series should be. So that was so satisfying to have that. And then to have that with its Williams element travel around the world was pretty uh, compelling to me. And I mentioned already about the Williams College Choir, and, and I just recall going to the first rehearsal that I, that I could, when they, the, the very beginning of the workshop with Brad Wells, and walking into the building and hearing voices which I could have sworn came from the Eastern Cape. And it, it was a remarkable moment. Brad Wells had found a way. He was extraordinary. He is an extraordinary. <laughs> choir master and he had found a way to bring from those students who are 17 year old and 18 year old Williams College students I could have sworn I was walking into rural eastern Cape wow. there's a remarkable thing it was so moving so extraordinary okay. okay thank you both very much thank you thank for bringing you. it back oh yeah thank you